Hello people, good afternoon, how are you? Welcome to my channel once again. This is Ikoku CC from the African Press Club live in Barcelona. I hope you've had a good week so far over here in Barcelona. It's slow. Uh, people were able to go out on the streets during the weekend uh, because um, the rules were relaxed a little bit. But uh, we're still in lockdown and um, we'll see how it goes. A couple of weeks ago, um, I was talking to some friends and uh, colleagues and everyone was on about the harassment of Africans in China. And um, it was a big issue. A lot of people started talking about it, blogging about it, um, writing about it. In fact, I also wrote an article recently on that topic. If you want to check out my article, please go to www.africanpressclub.com www.africanpressclub.com um, I got a lot of questions um, from friends uh, who are not Africans and we discussed it and I thought it would be a great topic to uh, discuss in today's video. So what really happened um, in Guangzhou, China? The story goes that some Africans were evicted from their hotels and their homes um, under uh, the harsh weather, it was raining and they had nowhere to go. Why? Um, it had to do with the global pandemic. Um, the Chinese government was trying to stop the importation of the virus from abroad, although it started in Wuhan, China. We are aware of that. After the months of lockdown, they tried to start looking at other people that are coming in from abroad with the virus. A lot of the Africans say they have been living in China for many years. Uh, Guangzhou is an area where they do business, uh, buying and selling, production and things like that. In fact, some of them who are married to Chinese also said that there was a sort of discrimination in terms of forced testing. So an official would come into the house, get them tested, but wouldn't test their spouse who is Chinese. So this was going on and thank goodness for social media because if there wasn't social media, no one would hear about it. China is a country that is very secretive. Uh, a lot of things you cannot do in that country or speak about. But in spite of that, there's also um, fake news everywhere. So when I saw the story on the internet, I wanted to double check and I read more, I asked around and indeed it was true. So reactions began to pour in from Africans on the continent and Africans in the diaspora and people generally. Um, the Chinese officials in Nigeria, for instance, were summoned by the head of the lower parliament uh, to explain what was going on. The Nigerian ambassador in China also tried to uh, tackle his colleagues and to have a word with them concerning that. And then I think one of the high profile um, reactions that I have seen is from the former African Union ambassador to the USA. Um, Her Excellency Arikana Chihomburi Kwao. She made a video and sent some strong words to the Chinese government. It was a packed missive. You can Google it, you'll find it. So there has been talk about that. Um, the reactions were that of shock, but to some, it wasn't a shock. Uh, people who have been traveling to Asia for many years will tell you that they have confronted um, racism, discrimination, uh, profiling on account of their color. Uh, Africans who have been traveling to Asia will tell you that. But this is coming to light um, because China is a big player in Africa today. 
uh, China is everywhere in Africa uh, doing businesses so people are really picked I guess that is why the reaction has been stronger so what is the position of China in Africa today I want to give a background for the past maybe 10 to 15 years China has been aggressive in its Africa policy the president Xi Jinping not joking at all with that a Chinese officials top-level officials have traveled severally to Africa to more than 40 countries there are 53 countries in Africa and every year their foreign minister their officials they keep going to different African countries trying to open doors uh, for businesses why is this so we are all aware that China is the factory of the world everyone produces so many things in China you want a pen produced in China um, low quality medium range high range they will give it to you you want clothes shoes bars jewelry in fact um, top um, designer companies and fashion labels also produce some of their uh, products in China when this is happening China needs the resources to power its economy where do you have most of the resources that you need to do this Africa Africa is home to many of the world's resources that is needed whether it's gold diamond um, so many things uh, for mining there's so so much mineral resources in Africa and that is why everybody goes there China knows that when you backtrack a little bit you remember that 20 25 years ago if not 30 China started um, growing at an average rate of 10 percent um, there was a serious policy to lift millions of their citizens out of poverty and they did that very well that growth brought with it um, uh, an increase in their spending and the middle class or top class the economy expanded while it expanded they were producing and you have to seek out places where um, you will have to feel to power this economy and so that's what's been happening when you go to every African country you would find Chinese living there they are involved in construction of airports, uh, railways, uh, roads, all sorts. Um, Chinese businesses, companies actually uh, come in and uh, stay put. They import their workers. Uh, they import their own uh, materials, products. They use it to work for uh, the contracts that they have bidded and won. This is the situation in Africa. So. If there is anything we have to be cognizant at at this moment it is that the Chinese will also lose if there is a backlash on the continent against them so that's what we have today what is my take on what is going on um, I will start with the challenges and then I'll, I'll come to what we can do as individuals or as countries uh, to um, solve this problem the beginning is that we have to look at where African countries are most of the African countries are tiny they're, they're very small so it's impossible or difficult for them to negotiate as an equal partner with for instance a China or a USA or the European Union how did this fragmentation happen on the continent? You have to go way, 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 way back to 1884, 1885 uh, at the Berlin Conference in Germany where the European powers decided to formalize uh, their colonization and um, exploitation of the continent. So you know, the place was completely de uh, decapitated along the lines of different countries the germans the portuguese the spanish the french the english you know it was a mess 
and this decapitation has affected the continent up till now. Some people might say, oh, it doesn't matter, this has happened for centuries, but when you really look at the reality on the ground, the foundation that has been laid for centuries is still actively working against these countries. It doesn't mean that they should you know, throw up their, their hands and say, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. That's not my point. I'm just laying a foundation to what has happened in the past that has brought us to this juncture. So you talk about democratic governments, everyone talks about, oh, many African countries are democratizing, they are less um, dictatorial um, governments and things like that. But these governments are really weak. Can you imagine a Togo, for instance, Togo, Togo is a neighboring country to Nigeria, sitting on the table, negotiating with America. Very tiny country, city-state. City, city you, you look at another country like Benin, Mali, Niger. Those are city-state countries who lack the expertise, the manpower, the capabilities, the finances to do most of these things. So they are in very weak positions and that's what obtains uh, today. The other thing I want to touch is that most of the population in these countries are uninformed. Knowledge, they say, is power. When you are aware of what is going on around the world, when you have an informed populace, it empowers them to take their destiny into their hands. It empowers them to be involved actively involved in the decision-making process in the country. I'll give you an example. I remember uh, when I used to visit my grandmother and in the village, I looked around, the village was a very sleepy place, quiet, really nice, countryside. You know, uh, people in the West will call it countryside. Very nice, um, quiet, close to nature. But what I noticed uh, with hindsight is that a lot of those people had no idea how the global world affects them, how the big powers affects their life. They have no idea that it has whatever decisions are made at the top has a direct influence in their lives. They have no ideas how maybe multinationals are digging up their countries and exploiting their resources they have no idea. They are not involved in the governing process at the top level, the federal level, or the state level. These are people who had a previous different system that worked for them before colonization. So this lack of information is a handicap. It is a problem. Going forward, it has to be solved. But then there's also the other issue of the people that call themselves educated. Going to university is not enough. Having a degree, three degrees, um, is, is not enough. There are things that are common sense. You know, if you go to the same villages, you see um, how uh, people of old used uh, to act. They did things based on common sense. So even without an education, you will see that the actions that they took, what they were doing made sense. So it's very important, it's not all about education. So the so-called educated people, sometimes they are also lost. They don't understand the game. They don't have an idea of how deep this thing is and how it affects them. They just call themselves educated. So what is the way forward? I believe that relationships can be beneficial and mutual. I believe that relationships should be based on equal partnership. Um, the predatory nature of some countries, it, 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 it's, it's, it's sad and it, it doesn't work because at the end of the day, it can backfire. Look at our planet, for instance, the rate at which we're depleting resources, um, it, multinational companies, uh, going on around and exploiting and producing and producing and producing and we're consuming and consuming and consuming even the things that we do not need. What's that? For how long 
we want to go about that you know so relationships should be beneficial between china and africa we can support one another we can help one another but people have complained about the way that that um, china operates in africa for instance the debt the loans that they are giving out to countries uh, some of the loans uh, have caused more problems for the countries you would hear things like okay china is going to seize strategic assets of countries who are unable to pay loans china has denied that but i believe there's no smoke without fire you know it has it, it, it has a goal on the continent which it is achieving but on the other side the africans seem to be losing so that takes me to my other point the africans have to step up the so-called governments have to step up the um, non-governmental organizations uh, civil society groups that work in those countries that are interested in the advancement of their people um, in the wealth creation of their countries they have to step up if china does anything that is uh, bad and walks away it's because they are allowed to walk away it's because they are allowed to operate in a certain way so you cannot say oh we're being slapped left right and center and then you fold your hands and do nothing so you have to re-strategize you have to recalibrate the relationship so that it, it, it goes uh, both ways or it goes two ways on the fragmentation of the continent one of the things that i see that can be helpful and useful is the banding together of countries and um, there's something that is going on that i think will help the continent on that front and that is the african continental free trade area agreement that started I think in 2018 and came into force in 2019 it's called the AFCFTA and what is the AFCFTA it's it's a union that Africans can, came together under it's an umbrella to open up trading within the continent to ease trading within the continent to have a power block that can be in a position to negotiate uh, with other uh, power blocks in other parts of the world what we had previously was that um, it was difficult for Africans to trade within one another or amongst one another. I'll give you an instance. You want to travel from Nigeria to uh, Kenya or you want to travel to Ethiopia. Traveling within the continent is so difficult and expensive. Uh, most times you have to board an European airline which takes you to Germany, for instance, or London or Paris, and then come back to the continent, which makes the trip very expensive. That inhibits any sort of a free flow of movement within the country, or within the, the continent. So the AFCFTA is, is something that can help to ease that. Africans should be able to move easily within their continent and trade with one another. So the AFCFTA, uh, one of its goals is to remove non-tariff barriers, you know, uh, duties that make it impossible almost for people to go to other countries, buy, sell, produce, and all of those things uh, which um, helps countries to grow. So I think it's a fantastic idea and Africans should continue on that front and on this line there has to be a lot of working together uniting so that you have a powerful block that can speak for the people the other thing is african so-called leaders have to stop begging please already drop the beggarly attitude you don't have to be you know flying to every country that calls you russia who's uh, Russia, African uh, summit, all of you fly there. China hosts, uh, China, Africa, all of them fly there. Uh, Europe hosts, uh, Europe, China, uh, Europe, Africa uh, summit, all of them fly there. Look, you have everything that everyone is looking for. All you need to do is to get your act together, be more organized, have a strategy, 
work with one another. We're not saying that whatever decisions you make will shut out anybody. No, you have a population that is young, that has the drive, a lot of entrepreneurial spirit within the continent. But these young people have no means to advance their lives, advance their careers, reach their goals, reach their potential. So you have to think about that. What do we do? Do you want a situation in your hands where poverty is the other of the day forever? No. So this is the way to go. And then whatever relationship is that is predatory, ditch it. You know, you have to gain the backbone to say, you know, this doesn't work for us or will not work for us. There is no other way. If not, people come in and slap you in the face, you turn your other cheek, the slap, you turn this one, that's okay, keep slapping you. You know, you be in a situation that is undignified. You know, so this is my take on this um, China-Africa issue. Um, let me know what you think in the comment box. If you like my video, please subscribe. And then don't forget to click the um, notification button so that whenever I have a new video, you would get um, a notice in your email box. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, taking the time to listen. Uh, read my articles on uh, www.africanpressclub.com. I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Take care now. Bye. Bye bye.